and systemic investing one gener regenerative solution at a time on the virtual stage. So let's welcome our food funded friend and advisor, Esther Park, who will be moderating this session. Esther, I'm so excited that you're a part of uh, this food funded event here again today. So thanks for, for making the time. Esther is the CEO of Sienega Capital, a regenerative investment firm utilizing an integrated capital approach to systemic change in the areas of soil health, regenerative agriculture, and local food systems. Esther, please take it away and introduce your fellow panelists, Stephen Hohenreiter and Nora Mai Kadena. The stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, this has been a really fun day. It's been great to see all the companies presenting and the earlier panels. Um, so pleasure to be able to close this out with some fantastic folks. Um, so I'm going to let you guys uh, introduce yourselves. And in your introduction, I'd love for you to just say a little bit also about what you're looking for in food and climate uh, when you're investing in companies. Um, so Stephen, why don't you go first? Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, I've spent the last 13 years uh, on a bit of a journey. Uh, exploring a thesis for how I believe our food system is evolving and looking for opportunities to invest private capital along the value chain of our food system in ways that would promote more regenerative land management practices, the production of healthy food at scale and connect people to each. Really starting out looking at um, the opportunity to invest in land and production and decouple the output from those operations through branding, uh, value add or other methods of vertical integration as a way to capture more retail margin at a farm level and help get farmers paid for those better practices. And then for the last few years, have really been focused more on the demand end of the supply chain, working with food companies who either have or want to have transparent, high integrity supply chains where there was an opportunity to help them think about vertically integrating back up the supply chain to create more demand for regeneratively produced ingredients. And so in the last year have founded something called um, Grounded Capital Partners through which um, I hope to invest for the next 30 years in food companies that can be catalytic and provide a platform in their, uh, in their category uh, and support other smaller companies and look back up the supply chain at um, co-packing, manufacturing, distribution, through that uh, value chain, create demand for more regeneratively produced ingredients. And where we have farmers and ranchers who are capital and land constrained, but would benefit from growing their enterprise, uh, actually buy land and either lease it or create a structure for them to acquire it back over time, uh, solving for our supply chain needs, but also hopefully uh, building capacity for their enterprise. Thank you, Norma. Hello, happy to be here. I'm Nora Mekadena. I am one of the two, one of two founding partners at Supply Change Capital, and we're a venture firm investing in food tech, food and ag tech with a culture lens. Um, our vision of the future of food is one that is sustainability mindful, supply chain efficient, better for you, and most importantly for our thesis, culture rich. We really see culture as a gateway to better for you food options and a more uh, sustainable uh, food system overall. So I'd say that is the, the lens with which we really think about uh, sustainability. We're an early stage VC firm launched last year, but I have been in the venture space for six years. And prior to that was, uh, was an engineering in the aerospace sector. Uh, with a focus on supply chain and operations. So really, really bring supply chain and operations to the table. Whereas my partner, Shana, has been in the food space for her entire career from the nonprofit sector to the corporate sector to uh, the, uh, working for a venture backed company. So together we can really partner with early stage founders uh, to help them think through their sustainable sourcing practices and, uh, and operations excited to chat today. Great, thank you. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed um, just being both on the philanthropy side and the investing side is that folks tend to focus on either food or climate, right? So they either have one of those two categories and sometimes it happens in the same 
um, you know, group or, you know, wealth holder, and they have these two very separated kinds of programs. Um, and so you don't see a lot of integration or coming together of those two sides. And I noticed that both of you in your funds are focused kind of, you come in through the food side. Um, so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you're thinking about the interaction with climate and um, are those you know, impacts that you're reporting to your investors, are those kinds of things that you require of your food companies to, to understand and to uh, contribute to? Nora, would you like Nora May, would you like to go? Yeah, sure. I can I can talk about um one of our investments as an example. And you know, we really do take inspiration from um uh, sustainable development goals and ESG standards that are that are uh, popular in private equity as we think about um the sustainability and, and climate as a whole throughout the portfolio. I say it it is most directly applied through some of the negative screens we apply as we're evaluating a portfolio company that is probably the easiest way to describe and you know as i think about some of those um, negative screen or positive and negative screens uh, during the diligence process you know some of the positives include upcycling of food products um, uh, data security uh, some of the negatives are high fructose corn syrup, any cell-based uh, products. We, we're really focusing on plant-based um, uh, GMO corn, unhealthy or highly processed packaged products, and, and monocrops or limited ingredients. And, you know, our thesis or, or our investment sectors are CPG brands, sustainable ingredients, and technology across the supply chain. And when we think about sustainable ingredients, this is key because we are, um, we're considering where the raw materials are coming from and the, the impact on the local community and the supply chain as a whole. And so we we're in the process of working through how these high level metrics and screens really translate into KPIs uh, for each one of those three investment verticals. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off with that point. Yeah, we uh, are very focused on the relationship between the land and producer and the food companies. Um, the food companies that we are investing in on a platform basis um, all have a history of focus all the way back to the land. Uh, even if there's a, an opportunity, and usually there is an opportunity to expand on that. And the way that we've approached investing over the last decade has really been focused on the interdependence of all of the stakeholders in the supply chain. It's our observation that um, one of the things that got us to where we are in this food system is a more siloed approach and a tendency to separate uh, the different components of our food system such that none of them is thinking about their interdependence with the others, but rather everybody's trying to extract as much as they can for their piece of the supply chain. And so the, the goal of our strategy is really to use these platform companies as, a, as exactly that, a platform where there's a history of integrity and connection back to the land, but then create measures that we can um, that we can use to communicate that story to people in a broader in, in, on a broader basis. Um, maybe I'll stop there. I'm happy to to go deeper in any direction. Yeah, um, so the topic of this panel is about, you know, systemic change, and I think there's so many aspects to the system, and, you know, uh, one of the things that was brought up earlier was just around land access, right? So Nick talked about preserving agricultural lands, and then earlier today, Scott was talking about, you know, uh, historically excluded populations and their ability to access uh, land, particularly on the ownership side. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. There's the actual farming enterprise aspect of it. There's policy. Um, there's so many different sort of um, pieces that contribute to the food system. And so as you're thinking about your investment strategy, how are you thinking about the other pieces that may not necessarily be the core of what you're investing in and how that relates to your work? So um, I can, I'll speak for what we're doing. And 
in my experience, there are opportunities for one, two, two different aspects. There are the ways that we engage day to day, either in investing capital or operating these enterprises. And then there are also the outcomes that we want to achieve through those operations. We always think about them uh, from an interdependent perspective, but sometimes one activity will benefit the other. And, and so maybe I'll provide some context for that. Um, when we are working in a community of farmers that may or may not have equal access to land, um, but where we have a need for additional ingredients, there are programs that we're able to put into place that benefit that entire community where they start to support one another rather than one operator becoming large to the detriment of others. And uh, early on back in 2012 with others, I was doing work in Hawaii and we were very focused on how we could avoid cannibalizing the more disadvantaged farmers um, because of our scale. And so we're very focused on figuring out how we build the health of the system rather than how we monetize the symptoms of an unhealthy system. And what I mean by that is often there is a, uh, an economic opportunity to take advantage of these dislocations rather than invest in the health of that system. And one of the things we often talk about is the fact that the health of any system is dependent on making every component of that system healthy. And as soon as we start to compromise any one stakeholder, we start to compromise the fabric of that system itself. And so we look for ways to use capital to connect the dots and support all stakeholders in order to build the health of whatever it is we're focused on. Yeah, Nora May, I know you guys talk a lot about sort of demographic shifts in the country yeah. and why you're investing the way that you do. And so I'd love to hear more about that too. Yeah, absolutely. So we talk a lot about the 2045 demographic shift in the US and one of our LPs coined the term, the new American table and talks about the, the exciting trend among younger generations um, that, that, are, uh, that are taking, so for multicultural audiences, uh, to upgrade views and reclaim the, the cultural dishes uh, through the modern lens of, of better for you, better for better for the planet. And it's uh, it's a really exciting time to to look at the food ecosystem from this from this cultural lens. And so, you know, as we think about portfolio level metrics, you know, on the environmental side, we're certainly thinking about sustainable ingredients. We are, you know, thinking of new to the U.S ingredients that have been around for a really long time in other countries and cultures. We're thinking about farming practices. We're thinking climate change. Under social, we are considering uh, diversity, um, not only within the founding team and the ownership layers of the company, but also the, the type of culture and impact this can have on full communities. If we're only investing in a you know, $12 dozen of eggs, we are not impacting the types of communities we, we want to impact. And so um, we would skew closer to an every table type of fresh food solution that can have different pricing strategies based on the type of community they're in. And so diversity is a screen that applies to many layers of an investment opportunity. Uh, cultural appeal is certainly um, something we think about as well. Um, we think of, of culture as a gateway. And so is this a, a CPG brand or a food technology that will consider, um, you know, consider the, the cultural aspect of introducing this a better for you, more sustainable uh, and better for the planet option? And is this a high integrity brand, right? Is this something that we, we want to promote and, and we'll continue to hold true to, to being um, high quality ingredient first. On the governance side, we're thinking about supply chain traceability. We are, we're following several supply chain um, uh, companies that are, that are tracing all the way back to source. And so that's an exciting space for us. And then the compliance and, uh, and verification space is, is interesting too. Uh, we are looking at a company that is um, that is doing. Uh, um, let's see, I, I just lost that thought. But 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 on the supply chain and traceability side, that's that's super important. Again, at the portfolio level, 
And depending on which one of the three investment verticals we're considering, there are additional uh, layers of KPIs we will continue to look for. But um, you know, the, the theme for us again is, is food tech from a culture lens and how the demographic shift in the US can really, um, can really usher in this, uh, this new American table opportunity for ingredients, brands, and technologies. Great, thanks. And I think I saw Arno prompting me to talk a little bit about the no regrets approach. So um, uh, no regrets, we're a family office essentially. And so thinking about systemic change, one of the metaphors I like to use is that, you know, the ecosystem is like a pot of water. So you have hydrogen and oxygen molecules like mulling around. Um, but not all of them are necessarily businesses, right? So the main thing that we do as investors is we invest in businesses, but in the ecosystem, we've got nonprofits, we've got government, we've got consumers, families. So there's all these other players. And so the idea is, well, how do we affect the whole system and not just, um, not just the for-profit businesses? So part of what we're doing also is we have like, under no regrets, we kind of have a family of organizations. Um, so we have a, a family philanthropy. So there, there we're supporting many nonprofit organizations in the space who do advocacy um, and farmer training and things like that. And then we have also a 501c3 that we're attached to um, that, that does educational workshops that create space um, for other groups to, to come together. Um, particularly around regenerative um, agriculture. So um, that's kind of how we're approaching it as a family office. And we kind of have the luxury of doing that um, because of our setup. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there. Um, I think so there's lots of questions coming in through the chat, which is great. Keep, keep them coming, guys. Um, we will have time for um, some conversation together with the investors. Um, I did have one more question before we head to that, which is, um, I'd love to hear kind of what your highest aspirations are as investors. And I know it's kind of an interesting <laughs> question. And what I mean by that is, I think that, you know, for us in, in No Regrets and Cienega Capital, one of my highest aspirations is to be able to touch on all the intersectionalities, right? So if I could invest and touch on land access and better food, and healthier people and cleaner water <laughs> and you know justice and racial equity i mean those like that is kind of the holy grail for me to be able to touch on all of those intersectionalities and i'd love to hear about you know what you guys are aspiring towards in your investing um you know esther for me it is uh, I, so i think about it from a fund uh, fund manager perspective Right. So I think that my focus is on getting more uh, investors who look like me uh, out in the market uh, because the data shows that a female investor is up to three times more likely to invest in a female uh, entrepreneur. And the data correlates with, with, uh, with background and so background and ethnicity. And so for me, the focus is, you know, how do we change the fact that only 1% of assets under management, the 70 trillion assets under management are, are managed by Latino fund managers? How do we change the fact that uh, Latina GPs only make up 0.1% of, of that AUM? And so I think if we can change that, um, that top level, and certainly the LPs who are funding these venture capital firms, we will see a more diverse array of solutions coming to market. Um, and that is only one, you know, one piece of the puzzle here, but I certainly have conviction that that, that it is a, a key, a key piece that will drive change. I love that and I'm right there with you. Um, how about you, Steven? We are really focused on how capital is applied to solving these problems. And Esther, I think you make such a great point about the need to deploy different profiles of capital, whether it's equity or debt or philanthropy or public funds to solve these problems. And have observed over the last decade, in particular, as it relates to the food system, that there's a tendency to look for technological silver bullet point solutions to these systems based problems. And it's our belief that the solutions to a more regenerative food system already exist. 
and it's a matter of how we connect the dots. And so I would aspire to creating a model for how we invest capital in a way that builds the health of the system by looking at the white space and connecting those dots rather than feeling like we need to invent a solution for it. it doesn't mean that technological invention isn't great, but in and of itself, I don't believe that it's going to solve this problem for us. And to begin thinking more biologically than technologically, even though I think they're complementary. And from a grounded capital partners perspective, uh, our goal is over a long period of time to build a portfolio of companies that represent super high integrity supply chains and contemplate every stakeholder from the soil all the way through to the consumer and collectively um, don't necessarily try to change anybody's mind, but build a model for uh, more capacity uh, um, in a more regenerative food system. Thanks for that. I love I love the idea of thinking more biologically than than technologically. Um, so um, great. So I think we are going to transition over to um, audience Q and A, and I believe we're going to bring Nick back onto the stage. Um, so if you have a question for Nick as well, feel free to um, pop that in the chat. Um, and I think Angie, you're going to help us um, with some of the Q and A management here. Absolutely. I was kind of looking. There are some great questions here coming in from the audience. So um, let me quickly pull it up. So the first one um, kind of coming from Arno Hesse is like he'd love to learn more about how to connect the systemic dots between singular regenerative enterprises and also within your portfolio. Um, let me see. And also um, with other investors in the community. So a couple of questions, whoever wants to take this one. I'm happy to, um, to respond. So, so often I, I find that when we're raising capital in the US, um, both as an LP uh, receiving in uh, pitch decks or in seeing others, there's a tendency to try and put everything into a really tight, nicely labeled box that says something to the effect of we invest in crackers from two to 4 p.m. on Thursdays will generate a 15% IRR and will return your capital in 15 years. And while I think we, it's important that we communicate our intentions and have a credible strategy for how we are going to invest the capital that people are trusting us with, I believe that it's really important to think about um, the different factors. And so um, I'll speak for grounded in discussions that we had about not taking a very clear path when you're having a discussion about investors who want to put you into an asset allocation box. We really are building a portfolio of food companies and that's where the corpus of the capital will go. But it confuses the conversation when we start talking about acquiring farmland in that company for farmers. Even though it's actually a de minimis amount of capital when it, when it comes down to it. Um, in my experience in working with companies like this, for example, a company called Gaia Herbs, um, they're actually farming quite a bit of land. Nobody would know it, but they farm 500 acres in Brevard, North Carolina, and it's very strategic to their operation and to the community around them. And so I guess I would just use that as an example of how we have to be willing to blend different um, investments into these strategies if we want to be able to take more of a systems-based approach. Yeah, so it's interesting just thinking about connecting companies together. I mean, one of the things that we did was we put on a, what I call producer aggregator meeting. So we brought a bunch of our portfolio companies together who are uh, particularly in livestock. And so they, they are ranches themselves, but they also aggregate from other producers. Um, and there's just a real hunger and desire for them to learn from each other. Um, and we also this year put on a direct to consumer boot camp for our portfolio companies because many of them have had to make that pivot during COVID to direct to consumer. Um, and so helping them connect in those ways. And Norma, I'm curious, I, I know you're a little bit earlier in your portfolio, but are, oh. are there ways that you're connecting your companies together? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. There is a there's a company that is not in our portfolio, but we are big fans of Progeny Coffee, uh, founded by a fifth generation Colombian coffee farmer. And so, if we think about you know upcycling waste, for example, this is a company that has found, has has figured out how to develop water caffeinated and, and decaffeinated. Uh, from leftover coffee fruit that is that is often discarded during the process, and you know beyond that, they were based on their intimate knowledge of coffee farming, were able to take a supply chain that is often, you know, up to a dozen steps and really cut it to three to four, uh, you know, three to four partners, and so in doing so, cut out a lot of the costs and are able to pay farmers a a better wage, and so I think that is a that is a model that that we that is a mental model that we are now applying to other businesses sourcing raw material right we're thinking how can you shorten your supply chain and improve your margins and what you do with that margin is you know of course up up, up for conversation is this going to be a higher wage is this going to be a fatter company margin are you going to find a way to to do you know additional economic development with this capital but I would say I love that example as a as a mental model of how you can think about reusing waste in in product development, but then also um, you know taking a very complicated process, shrinking it, making it more efficient, and then uh, yielding some some capital. Beautiful, and I love the shout out for Maria from Progeny Coffee because a couple of months ago she was presenting here at the Food yeah. Fund um, Jedi session. Nick, I want to bring you into the um, conversation as well. There was a comment from Johnny Rowland. I know you had a little bit of back and forth in the chat already, and um, when you were talking about the numbers, um, and you know, aren't all the investments being made by a very limited number of people that we're showing? So just give us a little bit of an update um, about your thoughts. Well, it's, it, it is interesting, um, <clears throat> you know, anecdotally, and, and we, we're kind of keeping a running list, the number of funds or funds with an ESG pocket is going up quickly. I don't know if it's going up necessarily as fast or faster than the Morningstar numbers because nobody really tracks, you know, kind of venture firms that are focused on, you know, one industry, um, you know, to that same extent. So I, I do think the number's going up. I think one thing that, you know, will will actually make it go up even faster is, you know, if you think about when do we make kind of the most impact possible, it's really when kind of supply and demand are in balance. And I think right now we could have more and more funds, but we also need more consumer demand and more consumer education. And if, you know, our industry probably has more power than any other to do that. And, you know, Better For You Food is somewhere between, call it, I don't know, 20 and 25% of all food now, if you look at New Hope's numbers or, you know, Spins Universes, and that's touching 50 or 60 million people potentially when you think about the power of social media um, and how that can do that. So I, I think you know that's very encouraging as you know people are thinking about their strategy and, and the impact they make and measuring it. Thanks. Yeah. Or, Esther, yeah, please. Oh, Nick, I was just gonna say I was really struck by that number of like 400, what was it, $450,000? Um, yep. per person. And I thought, wow, if we had better distribution of wealth in this country, like what could that really mean? Um, so anyway, that was, that was super powerful for me. Yeah. I would um, and and uh, Norma, your, your comment on uh, inclusion, I think is also a relevant one here too. Um, because, you know, actually one of the slides I, I have that I've given in, in a lot of other presentations is the World Economic Forum a couple of years ago had a gender gap um, initiative and they basically ranked all of the countries in the world based on their gender neutrality. And what we did is we actually took the top five, the US and Canada, and we looked at what was the GDP performance of those countries over the last 20 years. And the ones that had more gender neutrality handily outperformed the ones that didn't. The top five were significantly above the US and, and Canada too. It was like, we were like 53, Canada's like 17, I think. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, it's very, very difficult to do that for, um, you know, kind of multicultural uh, because gender is evenly split 50-50 for the most part across country. So it's real easy to track. It's not easy to have countries with, you know, such an equally, you know, measurable diversity of different, you know, pe people from different origins. But I have to think, you know, the greater theme maps. So if we think about how can we as an industry make the most impact, 
we need to have, you know, basically an investor base and leadership base that basically looks a lot more diverse than it does today. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of like uh, comments around what we just all talked about in the chat here. Um, I want to get to a very practical and concrete question because there is a ton of entrepreneurs here in the audience. So what level of MVP minimal viable product are impact investors typically looking for and what timeline typically are impact investors looking for return compared with traditional investing? Thanks, Caleb, for asking the question on behalf of all the entrepreneurs who would like to take this one. I'm happy to respond or to start. Um, I think it's important to look at impact investors as um, a group of investors that are really looking for additional returns and it has less to do with the stage of the product. So if we were to apply our, our conventional thinking to different stages of private investment, whether it's early stage venture capital, growth capital, and so on, um, those same principles would apply to investing for impact in these companies. So you have to have a company that meets this, the, the metrics of that investor. Then the, inv the impact investor is going to look at, well, what are the underlying principles of that company? What are they looking to achieve? What are the outcomes they want to achieve in addition to, to growing the product? And one of the things that we sometimes talk about is the fact that, um, you know, oftentimes people are so focused on achieving the outcome, the impact outcome that they strive to achieve, that they give up their primary due diligence criteria in evaluating the product and the team and the viability of that enterprise and the probability that, that it will actually achieve the outcome that they aspire to from an impact perspective. And so I, I guess I would suggest that impact investors have different uh, requirements for uh, product development. They have different requirements for returns and um, that the impact element is really an overlay on what you might think of as any other conventional investment strategy. Esther, Nora May, any, anything you would like to add? I'm investing, uh, we're investing at the seed stage. Uh, very little pre-seed. Um, our time horizon uh, during modeling is really data-driven. So based on the sector, we go back, uh, you know, about the last five years or so and, and take a look at exits and founding dates. And so for every company, that horizon can look very different. At the beginning of our investment period, we would have a little more tolerance for, you know, eight or nine years. Uh, whereas at the tail end of the investment period, we're going to be looking for companies that can, um, they can have a shorter exit horizon. So I think knowing when you're chatting with an investor where they are in their deployment period uh, is important. And then we, we don't really look at this any differently for you know, impact than we would a traditional venture capital firm. Uh, in terms of the ESG process, we have an initial survey that we'll send out uh, for the, the company we're considering. And we'll ask them questions around you know, some of the points I mentioned earlier. And as the diligence progresses, we would get deeper and deeper into some of the practices, your beliefs, your own KPIs. And uh, one of our post-investment areas of support is around DNI. And so we know how critical it is to build in culture um, early in building out a firm and also to have a, uh, an employee um, to have an ability to attract and retain employees. And so it is an area we spend a lot of time on with founders through our, a partnership with an executive coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there was one question from Ashley uh, Farron. She basically agrees with everything that we have been chatting about all day, but to her, one part of the current system is really being overlooked and that's the one around packaging. So how does the element of packaging fit into your vision for a more sustainable food future? And from an investment perspective, are solutions around food packaging, especially in the reuse circular economy spaces, areas you are looking for in your portfolios? Yes, and, I, and there are also are 
are groups that are doing great work around these areas that I think a lot of us are relying on. Uh, OSC2, which is run by Laura Dickinson, has a packaging group, which is a, a collaboration among a bunch of different companies um, that are doing great stuff. And then within each of the companies, we're focused on looking at packaging and, um, and opportunities to not only reduce packaging, but also uh, use different types of packaging. Any other thoughts from anyone, Nick, Esther? Um, well, I think there's lots of innovations coming along um, around packaging, and I second the OSC2 group's work on that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we have a little bit of angst about is like uh, people shipping products and what the carbon footprint is of shipping products all over the United States. And so we've really tried to focus on more regionalized models um, where there's a lot less shipping and thus shipping material that has to go into it. Uh, we do have one company that's trying to explore as much sort of compostable packaging as possible. And so her product happens to be lamb and she's wondering how she could use wool from those lambs as packaging. Um, so, you know, just in small innovations like that, I think, you know, we just need to keep iterating on it. One of the things that I think is so wonderful about stories like that, Esther, is if we look at how the consumer is evolving and how their relationship with food in particular is evolving, the authenticity that comes with that story and that experience for the consumer who engages with that product is just wonderful. And there's, you know, Nick has really wonderful statistics. And I'm, I'm wondering if, Nick, you, you could speak to that at all, given the work you're doing. But um, um, some of what we're seeing is that um, we're finally watching companies monetize the authenticity, traceability, transparency, and connection that they're creating with their customer base in ways that they didn't 30, 20, 30, and 40 years ago. Yeah, I think um, I, I don't have a great chart on it, but anecdotally and from, you know, what we're seeing, you know, it appears that consumer dollars are, you know, starting to accelerate more toward things that are sustainable. Um, so, you know, I do think if, if a brand is embracing sustainability and they have sustainable packaging, it's not going to go unnoticed. And, you know, anecdotally, you do talk to people that, you know, don't want to eat at certain restaurants because they have styrofoam and, you know, things like that. I mean, these, these things aren't lost. And I think in five years to 10 years, which is really when you're going to be selling your company, if you're, you know, founding it and getting it funded today, you know, this is a rising tide that's only going to go in that direction. And adopting more sustainable packaging earlier, you know, puts you in a position like Ben and Jerry's where, you know, you have that authenticity from day one. It kind of increases the value of that real estate in your brand. I'll add, I'll add quickly, there was, a, there was an article just a couple of days ago about the Phoenix Suns uh, forming a partnership and agreeing to become, um, to accelerate a plastic-free footprint across, the, uh, across their stadium, which is, which is pretty incredible, right? So a commitment to be plastic-free and they're working with a startup, um, not a startup, but a, but a, but a fairly, uh, you know, fairly new company that is uh, that that has experience working with fortune 500s and what they found through pilots and trials is that customers will pay you know 35 35 cents more if for a product if they find that it is in sustainable packaging so you have positive customer validation um the stadium news from the the phoenix suns is an is an incredible you know positive indicator that it is um that there is a market for this. And as we, as we see more and more delivery and takeout, um, I think it'll, it'll become increasingly important. We haven't seen too many packaging solutions uh, to, to date, but do expect to see more and more coming in. Um, sugar cane waste is, uh, is, is one of the raw materials that is uh, being used for, for some, of the, some of the packaging that, that I think is exciting. 
Great. Well, and there's one more quick question for Nick. Um, privatized land and disparity of income accessible to social justice and equity. How do you include these fundamental players as well? Theo was asking that question. Yeah, I, I saw that. Thanks. And I was, I was trying to figure out um, exactly to clarify kind of the disparity of income accessible social justice equity. You know, I think when we think about just at a high level, I'm going to guess at what I think you're going at here. At a high level, when you think about the groups that have the least, you know, income levels, those are the groups that are the impact is going to be felt greatest. So if you kind of go outside of our country and you look kind of more extremely to, you know, countries in Africa where, you know, more than 10% of people die before the age of five because they don't have vitamin A in their diets. You know, if you're sending, if you're a food company and you're playing there and you have fortified food going to areas where those people live and, you know, and those people can live longer, um, you know, that's a huge impact, right? And that's something that's just not obvious here. But you can see in the extreme example what a little bit of vitamin A can do to a village there, thinking about people who are, you know, the, at the lowest end of the income curve, small increases make a much, much bigger impact. And if you think about this whole thought of, you know, instead of relying on tax driven subsidies and charity, you know, to make progress and you apply that to, you know, essentially income equality, which I think is one of the best things, you know, to focus on in terms of, you know, bringing more equality, you know, through the Jedi initiative in society. You know, if you look at things like early childhood education or, you know, improving K to 12 or Vogue Tech in high school and you look at what are the, you know, the incremental GDP that you get out of that and the reduction in criminal justice. I mean, the economic for, model for that is very, very strong. I mean, you could do the exact same thing that I was talking about before with arable land, uh, probably even more easily there. Uh, and some of that societal impact happens well before that generation gets there, just as, you know, people are getting, you know, better education in their childhood and starting from a place, you know, when they're five, like, you know, everybody else is, or hopefully like everyone else is. Wow, I feel like we're getting into the juicy topics and I know we're close to the end. There's so much happening in the chat as well. So to wrap this panel here up, I'd love to have two brief thoughts from each panelist of you. What would you like to see investors do more of? And what would you like to see entrepreneurs do more of? So Esther's, anything you want entrepreneurs to see do more of and the entrepreneurs? I'll kick it off with you. Um, I would like to see more entrepreneurs like really creating strong relationships in their supply chain. Um, so understanding their farmers, giving them technical assistance, helping them, you know, increase their margins. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I'd like to see on the entrepreneur side. On the investment side, I think um, I'd love investors to just temper their expectations around return. Beautiful. All right, Stephen, what do you want to see from entrepreneurs and from investors more of? Um, I would like to see from entrepreneurs an effort to create markets for the output of these more regenerative farming practices. We've observed that farmers are willing and able to make the transition if they have a market to sell the product into. And it's very difficult to convince them to do so if they don't. Beautiful. And I believe investors can support that process by um, thinking about ways to deploy capital in order to support both the farmers and the investor and the entrepreneurs. Fantastic. And Nora May, same for you. Uh, on the investor side, I think incorporating a climate and sustainability lens into food, food tech, and supply chain investing is critical. Not all investors are, are thinking about this all the way, you know, all the way back to source. On the founder side, I think thinking about economic development and, and justice and equity, similarly throughout the value stream of building their businesses, um, are they, you know, are they supporting a practice that has inhumane conditions? Are they, you know, enabling um, impact across all the work they do. Um, I think that is a truly impactful business when the entrepreneur has the self-awareness to say, you know, not only is my product solving a, a problem, but my entire supply chain is, is vertically integrated with impact in mind. Beautiful. And Nick, bring us home. <laughs> Your two things, short and sweet. High pressure. Um, I, I think, um, I think, 
Well, I think in both cases, kind of just thinking thinking longer term, and you know, if you think about what the world is going to be like in 80 years, and the population is much larger, um, you know, sustainability and, and economics become much more aligned, right? I mean, for each incremental person in the world, you have to have more sustainable land to produce that much more food, and you reach a point when you can't do that. So ultimately, um, you do reach that alignment. But if you think about you know, if you kind of apply that and work backwards, if you're starting a company today that's going to get sold in 2030 and the buyer's going to be thinking, well, what does that brand mean for me in 2040? Then, you know, you can start to think a lot differently about choices around sustainability, um, you know, in, in, in Jedi and, and what, you know, the whole broader mission of the brand is. Um, so I think I think that. Wow, powerful insights here. I mean, thank you to all of you. I said we were just about to get dive down into the juicy topics here. So just big gratitude um, for, for the four of you to, to being here wrapping up food funded climate.